You're listening to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, Episode 77, How Blockchain Enables Peer-to-Peer Lending in Mexico. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Ash, and today on the show, we're going to talk about peer-to-peer lending. Our guest today is Hayden Miyamoto. He's a partner of Fundry.com, which is a peer-to-peer lending platform in Latin America. I think Hayden is based out of Mexico. Their tagline is arming the world with global decentralized credit and investments. Hayden, welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Thanks for having me, Ash. Uh, so Hayden, I've, we've known about each other for a while now, but you've been in various different businesses. I think this was a fairly new one for us. Can you just introduce yourself, fill in the gaps and what is Fundry.com? Sure. I uh, guess I'm Hayden Miyamoto, a serial entrepreneur all my life, dropped out of high school at 17, started my first business. Uh, Fundry is sort of my latest venture. Uh, I've been living in Mexico for the last, uh, five years straight, sort of. 13 winters, um, and I've noticed a big problem uh, in the credit economy here. So Fundry was uh, an attempt to, to try to solve that problem. Um, basically, the, the majority of Mexico is underbanked. I hate the word underbank because I don't like banks, but meaning they, they rely entirely on cash uh, for all their transactions. And this can present a, a lot of different problems. Uh, Fundry was started in 2016 as a uh, kind of fiat or peso based uh, peer-to-peer lending platform. And during that process, we encountered uh, several different challenges uh, that made us kind of rethink and overhaul the technology to to use cryptocurrency. Yeah, so I know that uh, lending in Mexico or in Latin America. I mean, you know, I lived in Panama for several years and you're right. There is a lot of underbanked. I don't, again, I don't like the term underbanked either because that implies that they need bank accounts and exactly. that's not necessarily the case. Um, what, what is the problem that you really saw and how did you get the idea to start working uh, with Fundry to solve that pain? So when I, when I first got to Mexico, I don't know if you spend a lot of time in, in Latin America or Central America, You'll, you'll notice one thing interesting, like the exterior of houses kind of look really, really ghetto and you often see like rebar stuck out of them. And I remember when I first got there and I wondered, you know, the insides were nice, but why does everything look like this? And someone told me, oh, there, there are no mortgages, right? So everyone, literally the only way that you invest is every weekend you and your friends might help you build up some like tiny extension to your house, right? So, so these houses are this, one way that everyone kind of invests. The other, the other thing I saw, and this was, I mean, this is probably more useful later in the conversation, um, but in the informal economy, there's actually a, a very common formal structure uh, in Mexico, which is called the tanda. Uh, and a tanda is essentially usually one person, um, either a group of friends or generally it's in the workplace, uh, organi- organizes this tanda and every week, Every Friday, people will take maybe 500 pesos, you know, up to a quarter of their, of their paycheck and uh, put it together to randomly be drawn at a later date as their investment, right? Because mm-hmm. at some point, they may need to buy a car or a washing machine or a fridge, right? Right. And I, I don't know, I've, I always found that really fascinating. I actually participated in tandas with my soccer teams um, and I always found that really fascinating, but at the same time, obviously not ideal. (laughs) Yes, it's very, um, I mean, it's definitely not anything familiar with us in the United States. I mean, this is unheard of, right? To go and give a couple bucks every week to to someone as like a a bank account. And they did this because they don't have access to banks. So just like somebody in the community would kind of act like, hey, I'll be the guy that keeps up with all this stuff. Yeah, exactly. And there was no real benefit for that person to do it. It wasn't like they were taking an interest rate or anything like that. It's just someone had to do it, right? Um, And and what I realized what it was actually doing is they were sort of utilizing a social relationship within pretty much like an underwriting process, right? Mm. And that's what Fundry sort of aims to do in the peer-to-peer lending scene. 
Yeah, and why do you think it is that the legacy financial and banking system is not including all of these people? I mean, I saw on your website, there was a stat here that this is worldwide, 2 billion people cannot access fair credit. Um, yeah, it's why? actually, it could be potentially a lot higher, somewhere between two and three billion. Um, some people use the three billion number. In, in, so it's, it's different in every economy, but specifically in Mexico and Latin America, I think a lot of it, you'll be, as a libertarian, you'll be familiar with this, comes to distrust with the government. Mm. Um, there's also the earning potential isn't nearly as high. And so for the banks themselves, it actually costs them more money than it does to, ha to open a, an account for them than it does to have them as a client. Um, so there's not really anything from a capitalist perspective in it for them. Right. Um, and, and then the other issue is like, I, I guess because organically things like Tandas have, have evolved, people don't really see the use of having to pay money just to store money. And the only thing they really see the use of in financial institutions would be credit, but there's a large chicken and egg problem regarding credit that, that no one has solved. Right. At least with the Tunda, maybe Pablo is the guy running the Tunda. You know him. He's part of your community. You can trust him. Whereas the banks, you know, the banks, they may think that the banks inflate the money when actually us libertarians know that governments are the reason for inflation. But they may not trust the banks. Somebody may have had a, a bad dealing with a bank, couldn't get their money out, was asked for too much information about themselves and just given a hard time where the benefits do not outweigh the risks for a lot of people in Latin America specifically to use banks. So they do come up with these really interesting community driven type of solutions. I know that even though the banking system has failed um, a lot of people in Latin America specifically, I saw again on your website that there's still a lot of loan sharks, or you said that the loan industry in some of these countries, specifically Mexico is dominated by loan sharks. Just a quick definition. Everybody's heard the term loan shark, but what is, what is a loan shark and what type of loans are they offering? So in this context, the loan shark is, is someone who offers loans at usurious rates, not necessarily like I'll go and like break your kneecaps if you don't pay me back. Right. Um, the types of loans are generally almost always is microfinance, right? So we're talking about loans of, you know, a hundred to 300 us dollars. Mm. Um, the, there, there are various sort of more formal um, companies doing this. Uh, the one that I like to look at most just because it's kind of, at least in the Mexican fintech scene, it's, it's sort of everybody's baby. But to me, I find it kind of disgusting. Um, there, there are a few companies, I won't name any names, uh, <laughs> but there are a few companies that are venture backed. Um, have literally raised you know tens of millions of dollars in the U.S. Hmm. Uh, and offer loans um, online. Uh, you don't need to provide much information about yourself at all. Uh, but those loans come at a. So in Mexico, they have something called a, a CAT, which is your your total cost of the mm -hmm. loan mm -hmm. uh, expressed annually, not just the interest rate. And so the cat on these loans is somewhere around between three and 4,000%. Oh, wow. For, uh, annually. Holy crap. Annually. Yeah. Now keep in mind, this is, uh, you know, like I said, a hundred to $200 loan usually. Right. Um, but, and paid back maybe in a period of a month to two months. Right. But still. And secured loans go at about 40%, 50%, but they require how much collateral? So it's usually the LTV is usually around two to three X. Right. Um, and collaterals almost always land. Right. And, and if yeah. you have three X collateral of what you need to, to borrow, then you probably don't need to borrow it to begin with. Um, it's a liquidity issue, I suppose. Right. Um, right. but yeah, I mean, a lot, a, a lot of the, the large sort of the middle class here that, that would be probably considered if it weren't for the fact that they have a lot of land that's usually just through inheritance, mm. uh, would normally be considered sort of poor. Yeah. So, so how do P2P loans disrupt this whole model and just define what a P2P loan is through Fundry.com? How, how does that work? Because I think that you guys started this before introducing cryptocurrencies. What was that model like? Were, were you able to get it working? And how does cryptocurrencies now change the P2P aspect? 
So peer-to-peer uh, -peer loans is basically just means you know one peer makes a loan to someone else. It's kind of a decentralization of, of credit, even without crypto. Um, peer-to-peer -peer loans are innately uh, local in nature, so they're they're only platforms that exist for Mexicans to lend money to other Mexicans. Um, this is because of a variety of reasons. One of one of which being you know a lack of standardization for for documentation, um, and probably the largest being just inefficient sort of cross-border um, transactions, financial transactions. Mm -hmm. um, there have been, uh, there are a few different peer-to-peer -peer lenders in Mexico. We're, we're not the first. Uh, we developed the platform uh, in 2016 and kind of with this idea that, you know, we really want to disrupt the interest rates being charged, right? We, we are not we want to give people fair interest rates. You know, mm -hmm. we want it to be something similar to what you pay on a credit card in, in the U S and kind of came to the conclusion that, I mean, while a lot of the lenders, yes, are greedy, there's actual sort of back end regulatory costs that are ridiculous. So for example, the largest of, the, of these is, is credit scoring. Um, it uses a FICO style system and Unfortunately, you're, as, a, as the platform uh, requesting the credit check, you're, you're charged somewhere around 25 pesos, which is around, uh, let's call it $2, let's say, um, to look up somebody. And only about the, the information is so incomplete that generally speaking across the board, only about 5% of checks actually turn into loans. Mm. So that means you're look, you're literally, you know, you're spending in many cases 500 pesos to make a 2,000 peso loan. And right. of course, this cost needs to be passed on sure. to the user, to the borrower, right? Right. And already we're looking at, if if you're looking at like a, a one month period on a loan, you're looking already at a triple figure mm. uh, interest rate. Right. So that was the first problem. The other problem was I'm also quite libertarian. I, I don't believe in in nations, you know, I'm half Canadian, half, well, I'm half English, half Japanese. My wife is half Mexican, half Russian, and we live all over the place, right? And I really love the idea of a global peer to peer lending platform in which, mm -hmm. you know, you, Ash, can lend money to someone in, in Mexico, and, and someone in Mexico is really, really happy for getting, you know, a, a 30 or 40% annual interest rate because that represents a tiny fraction of what they'd be paying otherwise. Right. And you are really happy with getting a, you know, a really high return that's completely uncorrelated, right? With the stock markets and stuff like that. So yeah. I love that idea. Um, so kind of to fix both of those issues, right? The global nature of peer to peer lending and the credit scoring, we moved to crypto. Mm. Because with crypto, what barriers did it eliminate that the legacy system was causing? I mean, the legacy system has, which was causing such high rates. I mean, I know you said the looking up the credit scores and stuff like that, but do you still not need to do that whenever you're using crypto? So crypto eliminates one of those pieces, which is the currency exchange and the time issue with sending money, which can also be eliminated if you just have a ton of money and multiple banks. And you accounts. front it all, right? Yeah like Western Union does, right? Sure. Um, so it doesn't eliminate the, the, the problem with credit scoring. I mean, there are, there are, there are companies like Bloom who we're partnered with who are doing crypto-based uh, credit scoring, um, sort of based on social networks and peer-to-peer -peer staking. But what was really interesting about this crypto movement, and I've talked to a lot of people about this sort of decentralization movement, is it's kind of, it's forcing everyone and incentivizing everyone to really kind of return to first principles and approach mm. problems using, I, I mean, with the, the framework and the context of, of decentralization, but it's still forcing people to really rethink how, why is credit this way? Why, why do loans work this way? And so we, we kind of did that in the, during the white paper process. And we thought, what, what is credit scoring really, right? What is the process of underwriting and, and what can you use to underwrite? And like I said, with Tandas, we realized, like, why isn't anyone just using social relationships mm. within the underwriting process? And we thought, okay, so, you know, within the context of crypto and smart contracts, how would that work? And it came down to this idea of 
um, having like a friend collateralize the loan for another friend using cryptocurrency, which a smart contract allows you to do without having to do escrow, without having to do all of that stuff, right? So it happens to sort of provide a level of insurance um, to, to lenders. Yeah. So as paint well a, as being a kind of origination. Yeah. Paint the picture for us. Like, let's actually get down to the usability, how, how this would be used. I'm a lender, you're mm -hmm. fundry, so you're the facilitator. And then mm -hmm. we've got we've got Jose in Mexico who's looking to borrow you know three hundred dollars worth of of loans. Mm -hmm. How does this look? How, how does Fundry create a platform to to satisfy this entire transaction? So I'll add I'll add an, another actor to this okay. to the right. system. Um, pick a name in Mexico. Um, Alejandro. Alejandro. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Alejandro is a Fundry ambassador. Okay. What this means is, so like, this is going to sound probably strange to American, but network sales in, in Latin America, things like Tupperware yeah. is actually, it's kind of like Tupperware was in like the sixties in the U S it's very popular. Mm. Um, so, so it's to just sort of go into someone's house and, and receive them and, and buy stuff from a catalog, mm -hmm. whether it's Avon or Tupperware um, it's, it's very popular. So Alejandro in this example um, could be selling a product using financing to, sorry, was, was it Jose Antonio yeah. Fun? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ho Jose and Alejandro. Jose. Okay. To, to Jose, who's his friend. Right. Um, or, or maybe Jose just needs a loan for a medical emergency. Right. Yeah. Um, but he knows that Alejandro is an ambassador. Alejandro basically vets and says, I stake Jose. We've been friends since, since we were kids. Yep. I'll put down, 30, 40% of the loan value in a smart mm -hmm. contract mm -hmm. uh, saying that I know this guy's going to pay back. If it doesn't pay back that, that loan amount will be paid to the lender. Mm. So it, it's guaranteeing against default. And in this case, you, right. Um, so sorry, I'm running out of names. It was Jose and Alejandro. Alejandro. Yeah. <laughs> Alejandro. Alejandro. Um, <laughs> so Alejandro makes the loan request yep. within the Foundry platform. Okay. On, um, on behalf of Jose. On, on behalf of Jose. Jose could also do this as okay. just a normal borrower. Okay. Um, but in this case, let's say Alejandro does it. Yep. Um, you have your own sort of preset filter on, on maybe you have $10,000 invested. Okay. Uh, this matches that filter and you make the loan knowing right. that, and that filter could be based on, I only want it backed by ambassadors right. with this amount of insurance mm. uh, and ambassadors of this tier um, and lenders who have this amount of history as an example. Right. And, and do, is it like an order book? Would I set the, the, the rate, the interest rate that I'm looking for the amount and the interest rate and the duration or, or is that. So not, not really. Uh, basically interest rate is, is set based on, um, the risk of the loan, which is established primarily based on how much history, uh, in this case, Jose has, uh, as a borrower. Okay, right. On a first-time loan, the interest rate would be much higher because it has to take into account that the default rate risk is, is slightly higher. Right. And is the ambassador a necessary part of, of the transaction? I know that it gives, uh, you know, it's nice to have somebody that says, uh, hey, yeah, I, I'm this ambassador. I'm building this type of social credit and I'm going to put some money up. Um, a, what benefit do they have to do that? And B, why is it necessary to have the ambassador? Or could Jose come directly and say, hey, this is who I am. You know, I'm going to collateralize it this much. I need this much money. Jose can come directly. Um, as a lender, you probably would prefer that there be an ambassador because mm. you are mitigating some risk there. Um, what's in it for Alejandro here is it's basically can become sort of a lifestyle business for him and a, and a passive income stream. Every single, uh, the interest fee is shared between you and Alejandro. Okay. And every single time that Jose in the future makes a loan, he also gets a piece of it and he also collateralizes the loan. Um, so it sort of creates this, I don't want to call it a job, but it, it gives some form of employment, right? Yeah. It's definitely uh, a, a value add. He's performing a service to try to, help people without a lot of credit and without a lot of reputation build their credit and reputation. It's like a co-signer. Like whenever you're in college or something, you need to get an apartment. Exactly. 
So, so the, the co-signing aspect um, or insurance aspect is, is one piece of it. The larger piece of it is actually the origination aspect. So in a lot of sort of undeveloped credit economies, origination is, is the largest problem for, let's say, a peer-to-peer -peer lender. Um, generally speaking, in the U.S., you know, people just Google um, loans, right? And they have a, a ton of different options. Whereas in Mexico, for example, that is an incredibly niche market. Mm -hmm. um, literally, you know, a fraction of a percentage point of the people who would actually get loans are Googling loans. So origination is one of the largest challenges. There is a, a company in Mexico called Electra. Um, Electra is uh, sort of like an electric, like a Best Buy, much smaller, but like a, like a Best Buy with uh, about a thousand, just over a thousand locations. Uh, they introduced product financing into their uh, business maybe 20 years ago. And when you go into an Electra, you, you really can't tell how much, it's, it's difficult to tell how much the price of something actually is. Like they literally call it the, the Precio Chaz Chaz. And it's in tiny fine print. Where you see the price is it's like, oh, it's 52 payments of 160 pesos. Oh, right, right, right. Right? Or you can pay the Precio Chaz Chaz in tiny like eight point font, uh, which is whatever, like 40% right. cheaper or 30% cheaper than that, right? Sure. I ran into a statistic that is mind blowing. Uh, Electra, as an appliance company, was responsible for 57% of all personal loans in Mexico from a financial institution. Wow, that's a lot of televisions to buy. <laughs> 4.3 million loans last year. It's a lot of VCRs. <laughs> it, it's insane. That um, is insane. <laughs> so, so I thought to myself, like, why can't you use, what if you could just electrify existing small businesses, right? What if you could just take the loan portion of that business, decentralize it, provide us an opportunity to like middle-class investors around the world mm -hmm. and just provide that to people. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's sort of the other side of the ambassador program, which is what we call small business ambassadors. Yeah. And you've got these ambassadors out there basically doing affiliate marketing for you. Exactly. So, so in your example with Alejandro, in this case, he would be what we call a casual ambassador and he can, he can sell loans or he could just literally sell productized financing for products that for other small products. business ambassadors right. Right, are not right. to. Yeah. Hustle it, Alejandro. Um, yeah. So the liquidity side, that would be, let's say me, for instance, in this equation, what type of returns would could I expect per year, let's say on if I loaned um, $1,000 or five or $10,000? As an investor or as a lender? As a um, lender probably around, depends on your profile, on your risk profile, mm. um, but between, let's say, 15 and 35%. Because 15, I, would send, I would send you cryptocurrency so we don't have to deal with the international banking system, and then you yep. guys have liquid, peso liquidity providers in Mexico that would get yep. pesos in the hands to the locals. Correct. Okay, right. So, so Mexico is kind of uniquely, has a unique infrastructure for this because they don't have credit cards and payment processing. Mm. So... Um, there's like a 7-Elevens and the much more popular 7-Eleven version in Mexico, which is called OXO, and mm -hmm. all the pharmacies. Everything has an option right now to exchange Ether or Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. And it wasn't, it's kind of accidental. It wasn't like, so, so there's one large um, exchange called Bitso, yep. which does sort of the Bitcoin and Ether. And then they work with these services that sort of are like gift card services that mm -hmm. have established over 130,000 locations. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's great. So the liquidity is there and yeah. the, the ease of getting the, the money into your system is there because of cryptocurrencies. I mean, I can imagine, you know, since I've, I'm quite familiar with the offshore banking space, if I wanted to send, let's just say a small investment of like a thousand or two or three thousand dollars to you guys, what it would take me to go through to prove who you were. Do we have a contract? Um, my AML and KYC to satisfy my bank pay $50 at least to send the wire. I mean, all of a sudden that stuff starts not only eating up, you know, my financial gains, but my time as well. If your time's worth a hundred dollars an hour and it takes you two hours to send this wire and talk to a compliance department, all of a sudden you spent two hours, $50 on a wire 
$50 for the wire to come back to you, uh, it's not sounding that great. Mm -hmm. now, now with cryptocurrencies, I could send you, well, we won't talk about Bitcoin because that's like $20 a transaction fee right now. But I could send you Ether for 15 cents and you'll get it in, you know, three minutes or so. Yeah, it was, uh, so three weeks ago, I, I was buying, making an investment in something. Uh, and I sent uh, 75 grand to somebody. And I asked, hey, can I, can I send this to you in Ether? Because I, I have the Ether, it's way faster. And the guy's like, no, I don't want Ether. I want US dollars. So I use this company, Cumberland Mining, to basically turn it into a, a US dollar transaction. And I looked at it. So I have the Ether scan address, and it cost me like less than 30 cents in gas to yep. make the transaction. It took seconds. Yeah. And then I paid, in total, um, I paid like $150 in wire fees, and it took right. like 10 days. Yeah for the in, actual us dollars to hit my account and then that to hit his account right it's, yeah it's 15 cents in three minutes versus yeah. 150 dollars in 10 days i mean yeah just disruption happening everywhere can you imagine what these big banks i mean they're they've got to be just shaking in their boots trying to figure out how they're going to implement cryptocurrencies before a, a bunch of you know 20 year old startup entrepreneurs just eat their lunch um yeah all right, let's. So we're looking at about twenty to thirty percent per year. You know, I, I like to talk about some of the cash flow options for my audience because, again, one of the reasons that I created this podcast is to try to help my fellow libertarians stop worrying about auditing the Fed and donating to politicians, but instead look for investments, cash flowing investments, build businesses. You know, start start getting in this mindset rather than the I need to fight against something. Get into the building mindset. Um, how, how does this new lending model create freedom and opportunity? I know we kind of hit on that earlier, but from the lender's side and for the person borrowing the loan. It, I mean, it comes down to, to money and how, how does money create opportunity, right? Obviously from the, for the borrower side, you having access to credit. I, I mean, I look at microtransactions as, a necessary step to build a, a history so that someone can make a life-changing loan. And, and I actually look at the credit, I, I look at credit as the most important part of it is actually financial education. So if you think back to, you know, the first loan you ever got, um, maybe, you know, you're just coming out of high school and you got your first credit card or you got a car loan, really what that was doing is kind of, it was teaching you about credit more than anything. And, and, and for me, at least personally, I got my first mortgage when I was 19. And I remember at that time that for me, I was making quite a bit of money at that time as an entrepreneur. For me, that mortgage was a, was a forced savings plan, right? I just, I did not, I was 19 years old. I didn't have the financial education to understand how to invest, right? And then how to save money. And I think that is actually, when you look at like opportunity, I think that's probably the largest one for the borrower. Um, for the, for the lender, like you said, um, you know, I, I live, my other business is basically a private equity roll up and it, li I live entirely off of what I would consider a passive income. So my life and my lifestyle is not an exchange of time for money. Um, and I don't believe it should be for anyone, um, in the world that we live in now. So let's so, talk, let's talk about what everybody wants to hear about is the token. I, I know you guys are incorporating a token now since you're doing the cryptocurrency thing. Tell us about the token, the utility, the demand, you know, some, whatever details you can, if it's not too under wraps. Sure. I mean, it's not that it's under wraps so much as it's in development. So, I mean, I don't know if we would ever want to do um, an ICO, for example. Uh, there are certainly advantages and disadvantages of both. If we did, the, the, then the token and the token mechanics would be based on, um, actually, I think this is a very interesting concept. So we call it the FAN tokens, okay. Fundry Ambassador Network tokens. Um, holders of the FAN token can become Fundry Ambassadors. Uh, Fundry Ambassadors use the FAN token to collateralize uh, loans uh, for loans that they originate in their network. Um, the amount that they make as an ROI based on the amount that's exposed to collateral is over 100% a year. Mm. So it's a good amount of money and it's quite passive. 
the idea here being um, Fen tokens are in demand because people who people who hold them already and are, ha are having success want more of them so they can originate more loans. Mm -hmm. And then as we enter more and more cities, more markets, et cetera, we need to sell more tokens, but token supply is limited, right? It doesn't mint, it's X number of tokens. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea behind it. Now, I'm, again, I'm not even sure whether or not we, we would do it, but this is sort of what we thought of. Sure. What I find really interesting around this whole movement is it creates a decentralized business model. Right. So, so our other option is for this business is, is raising money locally in Mexico through traditional means. And obviously that means people want, you know, if you do equity investing, you know, people want to share the equity and, and the basis of the business is then to stockpile as much profit as possible. Whereas if you look at in the ICO model or in the token holders model with a fan token, the idea isn't to stock the stockpile profit. The idea is to take as much profit as necessary to ensure the sustainable growth of the business, but otherwise invest and reinvest everything into making the fan token more desirable, which is a big difference when you, when you think about it. Yeah. And it's, re it's really nice because the tokens when used by the ambassadors that eliminates their need to use the banking system or come in and deposit money into your bank account specifically mm -hmm. to back the loan. So that cuts out a middleman again, uh, where, you know, other, without a token, they would literally have to come in to a bank and, and transact mm -hmm. and go through all of that. Um, so there's going to be no inflation you think of the token. Um, but you're going to reward all of go, go ahead. No, no sorry. Oh yeah. Uh, no. so you're, you're going to reward, only the ambassadors or is there a token distribution do you expect to the lenders as well? Because one thing I really find interesting about tokens is now we get to incentivize different aspects of our business and incentivize how we want people to act within the little community and, and economy that we're building. So mm -hmm. one obvious example is you, know, you want people to become ambassadors and the demand for the token is going to come because that's how they're going to help collateralize some of these loans for people that don't have a lot of credit rating with you. Are there any other, are there any other actions that you're trying to incentivize? Any other actions aside from originating and insuring loans? Yeah, maybe, um, maybe on the, I'm just, I'm just curious. I know I caught you off guard on this one maybe, but just on the invest, like the, the lender side, cause I could see like, yeah, it's just the ability to have lenders and ambassadors and borrowers for that matter. Um, you know, act in a certain way. Uh, yeah. So, so we have a sort of a reward system uh, planned uh, that does, I mean, it's primarily for borrowers more than, than lenders, um, okay. but does incentivize certain actions. Um, it's something for sure to consider um, whether there are other actions specific to lending. Um, I, I would say, I think, you know, we're going to discover so many things around the way, like so many mm -hmm. different niches and stuff that we didn't understand that end up becoming like a core part of the business. And I, I, you know, it's quite possible that as we enter other markets, lenders, that the lenders and the ambassadors in this case will be the same person. Yeah. Right. And yeah, that's a good point. The lenders and the ambassadors, because if the lenders, I mean, if the ambassadors are making all this money, I mean, all this money, I say in, mm -hmm. in air quotes, right. They could be the lenders and then, they would make money as the ambassador and as the lender, I guess, which would be a really great job. So you're, you know, it's job creation as well as P2P lending for people that don't typically have uh, legacy financial banking systems. Uh, and that's one thing I, whenever I heard about the project, that's, that's one area I really appreciate it is I, I really like bringing guys like you onto the show who are building as entrepreneurs services and solutions that are disrupting systems that have been around forever, creating jobs, and like you said, giving opportunity to people that normally wouldn't have it. I mean, a $300 loan, people, that's what we're talking about here. And that could be the difference between somebody finishing a part of their house versus living in a rebar struck house, right? I mean, it's, yeah, it's. That, it's I mean, it could be part of it, the difference between like someone's family eating tonight or not, or the difference between being able to pay for your, uh, your kid's surgery that suddenly is needed. You know, it's, I think it's uh, for a lot of people, it's hard to imagine what life without credit is, is like, 
Mm. Um, it's literally what you have in your pocket for what for good or better or for worse is what you have to buy. And if no one around you has any money because you're poor and your friend, friends and family are poor, you're fucked. Yeah. Pardon my French. No, seriously. <laughs> yeah. So, so give us, let's wrap up here. Um, Hayden, when, when are you expecting the network to be operational and when can we expect some, uh, opportunities for both lenders, ambassadors and, uh, and borrowers because Alejandro needs a job and Jose needs a loan. The, we, we will have everything operational locally in Mexico, um, this month, including ambassadors. I, in terms of opening it up to foreign investors, I probably a few months. Right, right now, what we've done is we just put the project live, put a, put a white paper live just to get people's feedback. Um, yep. I really like what's happened, at least um, that aspect of sort of the ICOs of just putting an idea out there and, and building a community around it to, mm -hmm. to get engagement. So yeah, we'll, we'll have something locally within a month and, and something international within a few months. Yeah, that sounds great. And if people would like to keep up with you, how can they reach you? Uh, best ways to sign up to the newsletter or join the Telegram group on fundry.network. Um, if you want to send me an email directly, that's uh, Hayden Miyamoto at fundry.com. And I'll link to the white paper and to the website and all the, uh, the fundry resources in the show notes. Uh, Hayden, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Is there anything we missed that you'd like to cover? No, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome, Hayden. Take care, man. Thanks so much. Take care.